Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey everybody, it's episode 111. Today is November 12, 2018, and you're listening to, or maybe even watching, Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Blake Arnsdorf. Nick is off this week, enjoying a little free time, and I'm joined today by special guest, Elise Hallett. Hello. Thank you for coming on, Elise. It is my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So we got a lot of, lot to talk about today. So we're talking about the Chinese gate recognition tech that IDs people and how they walk, three ways to avoid bias in machine learning, something very pertinent now, and then M- how MRI scans can be horrible for kids, but how virtual reality has actually helped. And then lastly, we've got Operation Lifesaver. So how Metrolink's unveiled virtual reality rail save videos to help people learn how to avoid problems at the rail station. But first, just a few programming notes for everybody. So welcome new listeners, of course. Uh, Thank you all for joining us today on this wonderful Monday evening. If you're joining us for the first time, you might not recognize Lisa's voice, but she's been on the podcast a few times. And you can always tune in next week to hear Nick's sweet voice as well. Uh, So just for those who don't know or who haven't listened to it yet, we have did some coverage of HFES 2018. And we actually have an audience survey that we would love, love, love if you would fill it out for us. So we have a link in the description, and we're trying to figure out how to improve and what to do for next time, for the next conference that we go to, for the next HFES that we attend. How can we just make the experience better for you listening-wise? Would it be interviews? Would you like to see us just do our normal feedback sessions that we had done before? But anyway, so we're looking for any feedback you can give us. It's a very short survey. It's about seven questions. takes about three minutes of your time. We'd love it if you take the time to fill that out. If you happen to be watching us on YouTube, or if you haven't, please, 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 we're looking to try and get that (laughs) name, try and get the last name of Human Factors Cast on our YouTube channel. We only need, what, like 40 more subscribers that we'd almost be there and we can get the official name before somebody else gets it back. Uh, But you can find us every Tuesday around noon Pacific. Uh, You can go like and subscribe. It'd be really helpful for us. Um, So... Something interesting is happening today, Elise. Can you take a guess of what it may be? What's happening today? Today we're announcing our second HFES membership giveaway. It starts today. Details are going to be in the show notes. And so you'll be able to, just like last time, go go to our raffle page and be able to figure out all the kind of consequences of how you can win an HFES membership for one year. Uh, a few events we got coming up. So HFES, HFESA, so HFES Australia 2018 is coming to Perth, November 26th through the 28th. Hopefully we'll be able to work it out with Mateo and get a little bit of information about what's going on at that conference. And it's never too soon to start looking forward to things coming in 2019. So we got the healthcare symposium. I know Elise is excited for that one. Got IEEE. We got Kai coming up. Lots of great things coming in 2019 as we round out 2018. Last thing, it's going to be the Thanksgiving holidays next week in the States, so Nick and I will be taking the week off. So no show next week, and we'll be back next Monday after that, November 26th. Just enough time to get you all cut up on that HFES 2018 content we've been putting out and fill out that survey. Um, but anyway, so Elise, what's been going on with you? It's been a while since you've been on the podcast. It, it has been a while. Um, so for those who are less familiar with me, I actually work at the same company that Blake and Nick work at, at Pacific Science and Engineering, but I also teach an Introduction to Human Factors course part-time. So that's through Cal State Long Beach. So it's a bunch of undergraduate students from a bunch of different disciplines. Uh, There's psychology, kinesiology, engineering, computer science, just a huge range of students who are basically taking this as an elective course and, um, you know, learning more about human factors. And, you know, so so I teach it and as exciting, I'm sure all of my lectures are um, when I listened to your and Nick's coverage of HFES and all the different interviews. I thought this is awesome. What a cool opportunity. First off, for you guys. So huge shout out to you and Nick for being able to to pull that together and interview as many people as you did. Um, Big shout out to... Uh, I was going to say it backwards, the Kermit Davis, the current president of HFES, because really without him, we could not have gotten access to that many people or had that many people come and say yes and sit down with us to have that conversation. But it, it was a great time. And like, thanks to Nick for doing a lot of all that, mainly a lot of the legwork to get that like taken care of and put together. 
Well, it was awesome, and it showed, and I actually offered extra credit to my students to have them listen to some interviews, and I think a vast majority of the responses that I got back were things along the lines of, I didn't expect this to be as interesting as it was. Like, I actually enjoyed it. Um, so awesome job for you guys. Uh, you know, just wanted to pass along that feedback. So Nick, if you're watching or listening, high five to you, man. I mean, we've made human factors super interesting to people who may not even be, you know, necessarily into human factors. Because in your intro course, I didn't realize that you actually teach a wide variety of students. Mm -hmm. Is that has that been challenging in some ways trying to make the topic of human factors like at a high level in an intro class kind of applicable to other people or a way that maybe they can walk away and take some of the knowledge they get and apply it to their own fields? I mean, definitely. There's there's a huge challenge with that, especially because I think human factors is still so new that a lot of it is heavily focused on like technology. But as you see human factors grow and you start to hear, you know, not just how it relates to people's physical characteristics and psychological characteristics, but looking at the team level, looking at how it shapes policies, um, you know, just, just a lot of different ranges. I think pulling in some of those aspects is what really stands out to people from a bunch of different disciplines. I think you're right. And so to make a silly segue, so speaking of policy, Elise and I went and voted last week. If you listen to last week's podcast, you'll know that Nick was super, super excited about everybody voting and getting out there and supporting our country uh, here in the States at least. And so Elise, tell me a little bit from your perspective about the experience that we had voting. Well, it was in someone's garage. Which was great, to be honest. I because okay for for me, I hadn't. I don't know. I'm not sure that I should even say this, but that was my first time actually voting. I'm a, I'm a bit of a, a different kind of person, so yeah, at least had a lot to do with that. Um, and Nick as well, for sure. But but it was something I hadn't experienced before. So going to somebody's garage in your like literally what two streets away from where mm -hmm. we currently live. And it was it was an interesting community feeling that I had never had. Like you had people coming up to the garage that we were voting in, like basically saying, oh, hi, I'm your neighbor. And they had never met them before. But we were all there for the same thing to kind of like vote and show show our support for our local officials and different things in our own parties and stuff like that. Uh, but OK, the big thing that I've seen and actually Brian, one of our Slack Slack members. And if you're not part of the Human Factors cast Slack, you should join in because you would know stuff like this happens. Uh, he actually posted a great article about how Florida, once again, like in 2000, has had problems with its ballots. Now, it's very much different from what the problem was with the butterfly ballot. But this year they were the article I think he put in Slack actually was indicating that people didn't even get to vote for governor because they didn't really know how on the ballot. Really? It was that confusing. And actually, when I pulled it up, pulled up the PDF of it and looked at it, it's not that different from what you and I were using. So I think that was the most surprising part to me is that, one, I understand kind of the, the problems with an electronic ballot or electronic voting, because we're just not quite there from a safety standpoint of technology. Um, Nick's actually brought up a couple times in the office just offhandedly, like blockchain might be a really great solution for something like this because of the security um, enhancements that blockchain does bring. But from your perspective, what did you think about the entire voting process that we went through and then the ballot specifically? Did you have any kind of like qualms with it or did you find it simple to use? I mean, I didn't have a huge problem with it, but I mean, there's definitely something nerve wracking about going through and knowing that even if you make the slightest mark in the incorrect spot, that that's not going to be counted for. So it's just a lot of care taken when going through and making sure that you're filling in everything exactly as you should. Um, I don't know. I mean, as, as far as the whole process goes, I mean, with, with this election, I think there was a lot of information that was put out, but, um, it, one of the interesting things about it was normally I get like a mail-in ballot and there, like this time I never got one showed up and the people said lots of people weren't getting it. So I, I don't know. I, I found that part interesting. Well, it had to be because you know, it was you and me that both had that same problem when we both had signed up for a mail in ballot, didn't get it in the mail. But then at least four people behind us said the same thing, because mm -hmm. when when the people said that they had over like 200 people come and vote, I was wondering, like, OK, out of this 10 people that's here, I wonder how many more have not had mail in ballots. So that's at least almost six people that didn't receive them. So it's that w that was kind of disheartening. But I was glad people were still out to come in and like vote in this person's garage. Um, but overall, I thought it was a good experience. I was pretty 
I don't know. I was pretty disappointed in the way the ballot was structured, I guess, uh, because although it it seems pretty simple, I mean, there was no room for error at all. If you make the wrong mark somewhere with these markers, you end up, you know, losing your ability to vote or vote on that specific topic. Um, but one thing I do have to say is, some, and this is something I was concerned about going into doing this for the very first time, right? Like these are a lot of topics that I don't necessarily know a whole lot of information about. These are people I don't know very much about, but I have to say in California, at least the way that they had structured the ballots to have the props actually very well laid out and give you at least some sort of as much as possible objective description of what the prop was and what it was benefiting and maybe what the drawback was. I thought that was pretty well done, Uh, but it still freaks me out that we're we're voting with markers. (laughs) Really thick markers. (laughs) Oh, man. So, Elise, do you know what time it is? What time is it? It is time. It's that part of the show. Let's see if this will actually work. Oh, no. We're missing the sound clip. That's all right. So, this is the part of the show all about Human Factors news. This is where we talk about everything related to the field of Human Factors. This could be anything from medical, transportation, psychology, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, automation, anything, you name it, as long as it relates to the field of Human Factors. So, what do we have up first, Elise? We have article called Chinese Gate Recognition Tech IDs People by How They Walk. That's insane. I don't even I don't even know where to start with this one, but I'll start by reading the description of the story. So Chinese authorities have begun developing a new surveillance tool called gate recognition software that uses people's body shapes and how they walk to identify them, even when their faces are hidden from cameras. The CEO of Waitrix said that the system can be can identify people from 50 meters, about 165 feet away, even with their back turned or face covered. This can fill the gap in facial recognition, which needs close-up, high-resolution images of a person's face to work. Already used by police on the streets of Beijing and Shanghai, gate recognition is a part of a push across China to develop artificial intelligence and data-driven surveillance that is raising concern about how far technology will go. You don't need people's cooperation for... For us to be able to recognize their identity, says the CEO of Welltrix in an interview, and gate analysis can't be fooled by simply limping, walking with splayed feet, or hunching over because we're analyzing all the features of the entire body. So initially, this is a pretty intense set of technologies that are put together to basically understand how you walk and identify you. So at least, what are your initial thoughts on this one? I mean, they're kind of mixed. To be honest, um, but the first th- when I was reading this, the first thing that I thought of was actually a homicide that happened in San Diego last month. I don't know if you remember, but in East Village, um, which is like uh, right by the gas lamp district, uh, there were two people who walked into the store, and there was a man and a woman, and the man was wearing this old lady mask. And then the woman had like sunglasses and purple hair and her hood up and they just came in and, and stabbed the owner. Like it's really awful, like really, really terrible. Now I remember seeing this on the news. Yeah. yeah. And um, they were, I mean, they had the the security footage from, you know, the, the store that this guy was working at because he owned it. He was working at this time when they came in and, and did this terrible, terrible event. Um and so you know, you have this security footage that captured these people walking in. You can't see their faces because they're wearing masks. But immediately when I was reading this, I thought of the implications in these situations of, you know, making it that much harder for people to come out and do these kinds of anonymous crimes. Yeah, I mean, that is a definite benefit, right? Because there's no real way to be able to fool it if it's able to analyze your gait and... I guess, I guess it's kind of a misnomer calling it just gate analyzation because it says that it's looking at the entirety of your body. So it's not really just looking at like the, the gap between your, your movements and your legs, but actually looking at your entire your posture and then kind of making decisions based off of there. Um, so for cases like this where we're talking about homicides, yeah, it makes total sense, especially when somebody's maybe masked if they do it more than once. That kind of can indicate that it is the same person. And who knows, over time, you may be able to, you know, identify people just off their gate. Like for right now, it feels like like the article talks about it's a lot of building that database so you can actually be able to do that later on. It It is in some ways a little little bit scary in, in the fact that 
just based off your walking patterns, you can be traced to any kind of location you go to. Um, but at the same time, I feel like this is something used for, if this is something used for law enforcement, it could, could be a potential to stop, you know, like you've talked about mass murders or anything like that. Uh, so to give a little more insight into what's going on with this technology. So it's, it's way more complex than just your normal biometrics. So the leading expert from the company on gate recognition actually said that it takes a bigger computer to back to do this number crunching because you need a sequence of images rather than just using a single image. So you can't get away with just having one high res photo. You're going to have to have a sequence of video or sequence of images. So basically a video to be able to do this. So there is a little bit of a constraint, um, but it seems like from uh, Waitrix perspective, the company that is actually putting this together in China you don't really need a lot of really intense cameras. You can use basically any kind of basic camera that you have kind of running CCTV in any, any kind of store or something like that. So it's easy to use or easy to implement anyway. And so you can actually just upload the video into the program and it takes around 10 minutes to analyze one hour of video. So that's, that's a incredibly fast rate. Now the ethical, the, kind of like moral ethical implications of something always watching you and always knowing who you are and where you are is a little bit frightening. Um, but I think this, like anything in human factors or technology related, it comes with a massive trade off. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, just, this is definitely one of those prime examples of it's only as good as the people who are using it. Um, you know, used for law enforcement for good, it's great. But um, I know at some point in the article, too, they mentioned, you know, groups that had a history of targeting certain, you know, ethnic or, or racial groups and, um, you know, increased surveillance of those groups. And, you know, so there, there are some some serious implications associated with it as well. Yeah, it's both fascinating and terrifying from my perspective, just because like it's it is a fascinating use of basically just small images that are able to be put together to determine who you are based on how you walk and how you move. But at the same time, it's like it it's like you said, it depends on who's using it and who gets their hands a hold of it. Like you could see this being used in the reverse. Um, if like an org uh, like a terrorist organization had access to this and could know where high trafficked areas for for you know high officials are or something of that nature, um, so it's it both comes with real it's it's that silly Spider Man quote like it's serious responsibility coming with this kind of technology. Um, but all right, so up next is something just a little bit just as just as intense. So at least what's the name of this one? Three ways to avoid bias in machine learning. Uh, so machine learning is something we talk about a fair amount on the podcast and, and coupled with artificial intelligence. So Vince Lynch, the CEO of IV.ai, an artificial intelligence company that teaches machines how to understand human language so companies can better engage, understand, and serve their customers. At this moment in history, it's impossible not to see the problems that arise from human bias. Now magnify that by, compute, by computing and you start to get a sense of just how dangerous human bias via machine learning can be. I mean, the damage is truly twofold. And we've seen this before, like with Twitter bots that Microsoft's put out before and various different kind of experiments with, with machine learning. But the damage can be twofold, like the article says. So people... Trust outputs of AI to some degree. So if human bias is missed in the training protocols, it could compound the problem by influencing more people. So you're disseminating a lot more kind of infectious information, if you will. And sometimes AI models are plugged into programmatic function, which could lead to potential automation of bias. So if you have bad information and they are running at automated speed in terms of like the AI's model, it could potentially be sp spreading bad information very quickly in an automated fashion that could be, you know, infecting a lot of people's thoughts or how they perceive something. But there is a silver lining, of course, because AI can help expose the truth behind messy data sets. It's possible for algorithms to help us better understand bias we haven't already isolated and spot any ethically questionable ripples in human data so we can check ourselves. So really, this article breaks down about three key ways that we can manage bias when we're building an AI system. And so the I'll list out kind of the top three and we'll break into each one. So you can choose the right learning model for the problem. You can also choose a representative training data set. And then lastly, you can monitor performance using real data. 
So we'll jump into each one of these separately. But Elise, I wanted to just get your overall thoughts, like from from just that high level overview of what this company is trying to do. How does it make you feel about the future of AI or its potential, I guess, impact in our field of work? Uh, well, I, I mean, the implications are huge. And I think that people, you know, overall recognize that people have biases, but I don't think they realize, you know, they think, oh, with, with math and science, you remove those biases. And, um, you know, forgetting that data in is, or data out is only so good as, as data in. Um, so, you know, talking about how, you know, people trust these outputs you know, I think that's something that, you know, we're facing pretty seriously now. I mean, you just think about, you know, a lot of the the ads we're exposed to or, or the various, um, you know, applications of AI and um, without, you know, thinking of these problems now, uh, you know, while we're ahead of the curve a little bit, um, you know, without doing that, then I think it just, you know, gets worse and has a lot more serious implications as we move forward. Yeah. And I think it's important now, especially in, I know Nick would laugh, like listening to Elon Musk talk about, you know, AI and how from like a regulation standpoint, we're pretty behind. And that's something he's tried to be vocal about in the past and not really got a whole, a whole lot of headway in terms of like the policy level. Now, of course, this is a, a article from TechCrunch. So it's a little more, you know, forward thinking when it comes to technology. So I'm glad to be seeing stuff like this. But I think the more that we're thinking about kind of the ethical implications of AI, the more important it's going to be to help us get better technologies out of it. Because you're right, and I think you made a great point. I mean, if you have garbage data going into something, you're going to have garbage coming out of it. It's just like when you when we saw like kind of the racist Twitter bot uh, that came up like probably about a year ago. It was a it was a good shot at trying to use AI to like show its potential, but not thinking about what the data set that they were using or was automation really tied, how was automation tied to it or the, what learning model was you used. Um, so I think there's a, it's a powerful subject. And I think this article really kind of get, at least gives me a little bit more insight into what are the things to watch out for when you're trying to create this tech. Um, so to start it right off. So the first thing that they mentioned was you want to choose the right model for the problem. So each, apparently each, model for AI is very unique. So the problem requires different solutions to provide varying data resources, and there's no single model that you have to follow. And so that kind of the example they give is supervised and unsupervised learning models, and they have and their respective pros and cons. So an unsupervised model clusters that cluster or do dimensional reduction can learn bias from their data set. So if you if belonging to a gr to group A highly correlates to behavior B, the model can mix up the two. So in, in other words, behavior B may be related to being in group A when it's not necessarily the case. And while supervised models allow for more control over bias and data selection, that control can introduce human bias into the process. So it's <laughs> that feels very much like damned if you do and damned if you don't when it comes to looking at these some of these data models. Now, I'm not saying that supervised or unsupervised are the only options. That's just kind of the, the high level examples that they give. Um, but obviously, it, it's kind of like any problem in human factors, though. I mean... You can't just throw any method at any problem. You kind of have to systematically take a, take it apart. Like if I'm if I'm trying to understand how a new piece of software maybe impacts its current users, I would potentially do kind of like a user interview and a usability test. But I probably would not do like some longitudinal study to figure out how people are impact impacted like in ten years when the product is no longer in service. Or if I wanted to learn quickly more about the like the the users that I may be working with in the future, you could do something like interviews or a survey versus trying to run a usability test with a product that may not exist. So it, I think it's kind of similar in AI. You want to select the right model for the job. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there are going to be pros and cons, I think, to any of these algorithms that we're working with today. And so understanding deeply those pros and cons and knowing when to apply them based off of, you know, when it's optimized. Yeah, it's definitely important. Yeah, so it, it's it's kind of tough to not introduce human bias into these systems, especially if you don't choose the right learning model. But I think the biggest one that we've seen 
in the media and that we've we've talked about a couple times on the show at least is when you're choosing a data set so you want to choose like a representative data set to actually help train your ai and build that kind of knowledge base behind it up so that can actually make decisions that make sense or are not biased so it's it's kind of the example they give and this is a pretty interesting one so if you only have let's say like 40 people from Cincinnati in a data set and you try to force the model to consider their trends, you might need to use a large weight manipulate multiplier. Your model would then have a higher risk of picking on a random noise as tr- picking up random noise as trends. And you could end up with results like people named Brian have criminal histories. This is why you need to be careful about with weights, especially large ones. So that's again, kind of getting it both the choosing the right model and then making sure your data set is representative. Like if you only have X number of people and you're trying to pull trends out of it, that you may, if you add too much weight to one specific, you know, attribute, whatever it may be, maybe it's like how tall are people from Cincinnati or what, it, whatever it may be, it could end up biasing your entire kind of uh, it, data set's not right. It would end up biasing your entire kind of like AI decision making process. Wow, but- yeah, anything that it because again, if you put in bad information into it, it doesn't really know that it's bad information unless you tell it so. Yeah, I mean, it's like going back to your example of the different human factors methods. If you're only sampling a small subset of your user base, you know, say it's just this younger population and you're trying to support all sorts of um, ages, then you know you're going to get biased results. It's it's a similar thing. Yeah, so I think it's really important to make sure your training data is just like diverse enough to support the outcomes that you want. Um, because if you're only interested in a small segmentation of the population, then maybe having a targeted data set's way better. But if you're interested in kind of using your AI, your algorithm or your machine learning algorithm to really make decisions from a, in a wide, broad spectrum, you're going to have to give it a lot of different types of data. All right. So last piece is monitoring performance in using real data. So, of course, no company is going to try and create any kind of biased AI, but it does happen. So unfortunately, regulators don't typically take the best intentions into account when assigning liability and ethical violations. That's why you should be simulating real world applications as much as possible when building algorithms. And I think this is one of the more important points, three really high level good ideas, selecting the right model and um, selecting the correct data is really important, but then what you're applying it to, like it's, it's kind of the problem that I ran into when I first got into got out of school in the applied field is you start to realize that you can't control nearly as much as you were able to in a small lab. And you have to be able to quickly adapt to that in the real world to make sure that you're getting actionable answers or making good decisions based on kind of what feedback you do have. So that it's kind of the same thing. It sounds like an AI kind of in an analogous way. Like if you've selected both good data and a good model for learning, you still want to make sure that you're testing this for what you actually want it to be used for. But I mean, that's just, that's kind of like how it runs with anything. Um, So it it kind of talks a little bit about, uh, so when you're, when you're actually examining your own data, you could be looking for two types of equality. And I think this is another kind of a final closing important point. So quality of outcome and quality of opportunity. So if you're working on AI for approving loans result, result equality would mean that people from all cities get loans at the same rates and then opportunity opportunity equality would then mean that people who who would have returned the loan if given the chance are given the same rates regardless of the city so without the latter the former would still hide if one if one city has culture has a culture that makes defaulting on loans more common. So that's kind of a convoluted example, but I think the importance is, is like whatever your outcome is going to be, you have to provide it like the data, the, the kind of like picking the right training data was talking about. You have to provide it with the correct weights for it to be able to make the decisions you're looking for. So if it, it can't make, it can't make decisions on its own about like what's going on in the culture. If you don't give it any kind of information about it, like in this case, it would only be able to make decisions based on, Some people get loans and some people don't. And without the correct weights to the data, you're not going to get really any more information about it. So, Lise, do you have any kind of like closing thoughts about 
how how we can better create AI or maybe the impacts it might have in human factors in general or maybe even healthcare? Uh, you know, I think with this, you know, all these these you know three points that touch on bias. Really, just thinking about what what are you using this for? What's what's the real world implications? And then the monitoring after, and um, you know, taking care to to really think about you know what it is that you're applying this for. Yeah, and I have to say, I was really this article is really good. I mean, I can't even. I can't even really explain some of the points as well as I would like to because I'm so, so out of the loop in terms of really how AI works. But they had a really good closing point that I think is important for us to a lot of people to think about. So the three points they mention are obviously good practices to follow, but it's important to be thinking proactively about the ethics regardless of regulatory environments. And let's take a look at the several points to keep in mind as you work on AI. So it's great to like put these kind of guidelines together. Um, but it's more important to be keeping keeping in your mind like what's going on ethically around these decisions you're making and be proactive about the, about the kind of applications of AI and making sure that it really it re, that whatever you're doing really needs the technology. Um, so so that was a tough one, super super long article, but very very interesting. So I'm gonna take a little break for right now, and we'll be back in a few seconds. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Excellent. All right. So before we move on, I wanted to say thanks to all of our friends at AP News, TechCrunch, Rail News, and The Guardian for all of our stories this week. If you want to follow along with us on social media or join our Slack for the links to the original articles. All right, Elise, we got two more stories before we close this out. What's going on in the first one? All right. So this first one is titled Operation Lifesaver Metro Links Unveil Virtual Reality Rail Safety Video for Railroad Career Professionals. Excellent. All right. So Operation Lifesaver Canada and Metro Metrolinks have unveiled a virtual reality video designed to promote safety um, around tracks and trains. So filmed from the point of view of a commuter rail passenger, the video immerses viewers in a 3D environment and gives them an unsettling experience of how quickly and quietly a train can appear. Operation Lifesaver officials said in a press release that the video is the latest addition to the nonprofit organization's Look, Listen, and Live virtual reality safety campaign launched back in April. Their overall message is that rail passengers to rail passengers is simple. So please obey railway warning signs and signals. They're there to keep us safe, and failing to do so can have terrifying or deadly consequences. Metrolinx has set up a booth equipped with VR headsets in Toronto's Union Station so that passengers may view the video. So thanks to the powerful Mateo for this story. He put the, la the last two stories in Slack, uh, and I pulled them out this morning. I thought they'd be good ones to talk about. But I don't know, and a little bit of this I picked up because I know Nick loves VR so much, but I thought it was a great application for people to understand kind of safety consequences of breaking the rules or not following signs. But at least, what do you think initially? I thought, did you watch this video? I have not seen the video. It is insane. Yeah, um, what's insane about it? Well, okay, so I, I mean, they just do such a good job at first, like framing this scenario, like, you know, it's, it's a commuter getting off at the end of a long day and, you know, kind of, kind of like, I wasn't even watching it in VR. I was just watching it on my laptop. So it wasn't, I didn't even get the immersive part of it, but you know, you get these <clears throat> flashes of, of text kind of putting you in this, this perspective, this, you know, mentality, like you're a commuter getting off work, um, you know, what the possible misinterpretation of some of the railway signs could be. So, you know, you see flashing, oh, it's probably just the train I just got off of. And then boom, like this train comes out of nowhere. And it's like, it's really startling. But I just thought, 
that they did such a fantastic job of identifying, uh, you know, a, a typical scenario that I think a lot of people can relate to and coming at it very objectively. Um, you know, nobody's intentionally running across railways, you know, for the most part in, you know, a, a dangerous mine, you know, just trying to get home quickly. And yeah, here it comes. <laughs> this is so terrifying. Oh, yep. and yep. you get hit yep. by a train. I don't even need to be wearing a VR headset to be totally like my heart just skipped. I, I don't know if I would want to be wearing one. Oh, like, wow. It's so intense. That's really intense, Metrolinx. Okay. Yeah, so so literally like Elise described, it's it's putting you in a real world scenario. And I've ridden kind of the train in California a few times up to uh, up to Auburn. <laughs> no, that's not right. Even though there is an Auburn, California, there is. Uh, but I've ridden the train a few times from San Diego to Irvine when I used to live in Irvine, and this train looks exactly like the train that I used to ride. And I never even really thought twice about like getting on and off of it or looking all the ways. I think I was more concerned about like trying to get from point A to point B. And I, I, I think the video actually does a really good job of kind of sh immersing you in the experience. But also the, the thing that's interesting to me is the, the text where I thought, I thought that was going to take me out of the experience. It's actually almost putting thoughts in my head. Mm -hmm. Like you're, like it's kind of just it's almost describing the use case as you're going through it in the VR experience or on the YouTube experience. And so it's, it's it's a little terrifying. Yeah, I thought whoever put together this video did a really good job at identifying who they're really trying to target with this training. Um, you know, what what are the common mental models and thought processes that these people are faced with? What what are their challenges? You know, in this case, it's you know, I'm trying to get home as quickly as possible. That's my goal. That's my objective. And framing this in terms of that, instead of framing it in terms of you shouldn't walk across the railways, you know, because people aren't listening to that and there's a reason for it. So, um, you know, people putting this in, in common goals that people are already faced with and, and considering already, I, I just thought it was really fantastic. Yeah, it's pretty intense. I have to say one thing that I, I think they're really, hit the nail hit the nail on the head with is maybe this will help you know younger people but especially anybody who's never ridden a train before understand the dangers of it cuz i maybe i've just never haven't been around trains that much but in the article or in, and in the video it talks a lot about you can't always hear a train mm -mm. i think my entire life i've grown up like being able to hear trains where i used to live um so that's a big part and i think this is a really good kind of use of technology and campaign strategy to get like younger people involved and maybe convey a message that they would otherwise just kind of like let go off to the wayside. So maybe this will save some younger people's lives. I think it's a really great use of VR. All right. So we got one final story up this week. Elise, what's, what's the title of this one? This one is called MRI scans are horrible for kids. So I created a virtual reality app to help. Yes. Okay. So this is another story from one of our Slack listeners, Slack members and listeners, Mateo. This is a little bit of an old, older article, article, but I figured I, <laughs> but I figured I'd bring, bring it on because it's virtual reality in a healthcare setting. And I know that Elise is very interested in this kind of space. So this is kind of told from first person perspective, but it is not me. I'm not a physicist. Do not worry. So a physicist's job is not typically to see patients, but they are, they really have to focus on getting some of the technologies running and making sure they work well. So one thing you do see as a physicist, however, regardless of you, if you're seeing patients, is you can't help but notice the difficulties for children undergoing treatment with, if, with MRI scanners in the radio, radiology department. So scanners are noisy. They're small tunnels and pin up and down for an hour. Uh, that can, and you could liken it to almost some kind of torture device of so something you might see in a James Bond film. So even adults collapse in tears at the thought of going in so far, going in one. So for children, this can be especially traumatic. So often the only option is to put the child to sleep, which is a procedure that is both costly and adds risk and can often be quite scary. So this physicist at the end, NHS decided to take things into his own hands and captured a full panorama and decided to take things into, and into his own hands, making a better experience for children coming in for a scan, making using virtual reality. He captured a full panorama of world of the world using a 360 degree camera. And so children are typically embracing VR. So technology much more, much like the generation that embraced the original computer. 
And like the computer, I think it's only a matter of time before VR becomes part of our everyday lives. So this is pretty epic experience to have, right? So if you, as an outsider working in radiology, you see some kind of problem, noticing that one, adults themselves have a problem getting in MRI machines. I've been in one a, a couple of times and it's it's not a fun experience. I'm not one that really gets claustrophobic or really freaked out by going in one, but it's not comfortable. And usually why you're there is not a good reason. It's because, I mean, it's, it's scanning your entire body. Sometimes if it's C CT scan, it's a little scary. It's looking at your brain. So I can only imagine that for a child, it's the same thing. Very, very scary experience. You're not really sure what's going on, depending on what age you're at. And so now you're having like trauma between parents and children trying to deal with this. And I think it's amazing that this physicist was able to create some kind of virtual experience that really allows kids to understand from like kind of a, in a playful way what's really going on. But but Elise, can you give me kind of your take on what this really means for healthcare? Uh, I mean, the implications are huge. You you touched on a really good point. The reason why generally why you're getting these scans is not generally a positive one. So a lot of times when people are going to hospitals, there are these negative implications associated with it. And like walking around a hospital, a lot of times, you know, they're, they're changing this, but it feels very sterile and, and white with these like fluorescent lighting and it just feels harsh and you've got these negative connotations going into something that has these negative connotations to your body and your health and you don't know what's going on. And, um, you know, a lot of people have never experienced something like this before. And so it's, it can be a very scary experience. And especially with something like this, where you're reading put into this tiny little tunnel and then you've got these loud clunking noises all over. Like, I, yeah, I, I would be terrified doing this and I am much older than four years old. <laughs> so I think you did a great job kind of picking a way to make it an interesting voyage. Cause that's kind of the, the theme here, but an interesting um, kind of experience for kids. So if uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see the video coming up about this. But to describe to the listeners that are only <laughs> only listening to the podcast and not watching is basically the VR app kind of changes the entire outside of the machine to look like it's a not a pirate ship. I would imagine it's a pirate ship as a young man, but that's just me. But it basically looks like you're on a boat and you're about to go like sail into the ocean. And so it's it's covering the entire machine. You can't even really notice that there's any kind of machinery at all because um, it's you're basically looking looking down the mast and about to like steer some ship. And I would imagine that with the sounds this thing makes, it might feel like, you know, the creaking of a boat in water or something like that. So it's a really sneaky play on kind of playing on kids' imaginations and playing that fact up so that one, they're in a VR experience and two, like all the sounds and the feelings that they're having, maybe they can just translate that to what they're seeing through their VR goggles instead of being really freaked out that they're in like a small tube or a machine. Um, so this was just kind of a fun one. I didn't really have a whole lot of like exact points about this, but I just really enjoyed the idea of creating experiences like this using technology for kids uh, that make something really scary for both parents and children a little more, a little bit more manageable. It can't really take all the kind of like sting out of it, but it's pretty interesting. Yeah, definitely. Putting it, putting your expectations and, you know, kind of a different flavor. Yeah. So at least do you have any other closing thoughts about the final story? No, apart from I, it makes me kind of want to go get an MRI scan. I do not want to get one. I do want to experience the VR experience that this guy created because it sounds like fun. But all right. So we're coming up to my favorite part of the show. This is let's see if I can click the right button this time. It came from. Yes, that's right. It's it came from Reddit. So we're going to actually switch gears a little bit and answer some questions from Reddit. So this is part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics about the, the community is talking about. Any subreddit is actually fair game as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion amongst the community. All right. So at least we've got three here. Is there one that you're more interested in answering? Probably take a stab at the first one. You want to take a stab at the first one? All right. So the first one comes from Clone Man from the user experience subreddit, and it's how to measure user frustration and anxiety with using an interface. So here's a little bit more. So hi, I'm not a UX professional by any measure, 
but I do see a lot of people getting frustrated by interfaces. I'm a little hypersensitive to it and curious about how you how this stuff could be measured. Are there studies that measure this measure user frustration with an interface? Look at human factors, brain scans, twitching, and survey interview questionnaires. Or even more interesting, has anyone designed an app or game whose sole purpose is to measure the user's willpower as it presents anxiety providing experiences? Like figure out like figure out when a user is going to give up because your <laughs> annoying menu layout. All right. So this is something we've definitely probably all had experience with in human factors or definitely an interface design. So I'm gonna let you take a crack at it. So how would you measure the user frustration or anxiety while using an interface? Uh, well, first off, I mean, observations through usability assessments, I think is uh, probably key with this, being able to observe that, um, capture that objectively, and then also through different types of questionnaires and interviews. Um, but something for me that's been really powerful with this, I mean, I don't know of anyone that's designed an app purposefully to make people frustrated, um, but I have had experience where there are a couple design options. And, you know, if I'm on a team and the developers are like, no, like this option is the best and, you know, trying to use best practices and such and, and arguing for, you know, maybe a different design is not as impactful as sitting and watching someone can, like many people experience frustration with a certain type of design and trying to work through a task. Um, <clears throat> that observation is really, really powerful. So getting, um, you know, people from your team to observe, um, you know, preferably if there's, you know, kind of divvied off room so that they can just observe and not like go in and tell them how to do that. Um, but that I think is so powerful in terms of, um, designing interfaces and and getting that emotional reaction up front. Um, so, you know, various types of observation methods and, and questionnaires, I think, are pretty key for this. Yeah, I mean, I'm and I'm going to follow the same lines as you. I think you could probably Google or search for any kind of user frustration and anxiety metric and you would find one. But in terms of the application to interface design, I don't know, I, I, maybe it's because I'm biased because I saw a lot of this or I got to experience doing a fair amount of kind of like two mirror usability testing when I was in grad school. But I think that's the best way to really understand user frustration and maybe not anxiety because some people may not be able to tell you that's what they're experiencing. Um, but definitely user frustration because watching somebody interact with the interface and not know how to do it, you have to sometimes you have to pick up on those nonverbal cues or facial expressions and as a scientist kind of ask a little bit more about like, hey, what did you expect there or what what did you expect to happen in that case? Or is everything going all right? Those kind of small questions to draw out a little more information about how they're feeling in their, you know, interaction with the interface. Another way that I found really useful, especially for uh, a project I did back in grad school was um cognitive walkthrough so as somebody's trying to complete a task having them describe the things that they're doing as they go through it because that'll there was a, a particular participant that i had that was very very vocal about being frustrated with a specific aspect of a website um, ha for something they had to do all the time for their job um, and so those kind of metrics or those kind of methods i think really can illuminate where their problems in products or interfaces or websites and I would say one of the the keys with some of these assessments is being comfortable with the frustration. I think it's really hard to sit there and, and watch people get frustrated with trying to use something. And, and you can get at that, you know, with a variety of different ways that you set up this test. But but the important thing is knowing not to step in and try to to help that person or or alleviate the frustration, but like really being comfortable with with sitting there and experiencing it with them so that you can get them to explain what's going on, what they're experiencing, what they're expecting, um, you know, what they're frustrated about and pull out those rich details because that's really the the why and how you're gonna make it better. Exactly. So I, I think that's a that's a good way to cover that particular question. I want to dive into this other question we have. So how important, oh, sorry. So this comes from, oh man, hey, 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 man, from the user experience hey. subreddit. 
<laughs> Hi. Uh, so this question is how how important is it to mention your team members in your portfolio case study? So asking like should you name them by name, add their portfolio or LinkedIn, or mention just what kind of people work you worked with, or is any of that enough, or do you include none of that? Um, so Elise, do you do you want to tackle this one? Yeah, I can take a first crack. All right, it. take a first crack. Um, so at the company that I work at, I actually help a bit with the interview process and reviewing people's, you know, portfolios and resumes. For me personally, when I look at this type of information, I don't really care about the specific who's because for the most part, that doesn't really mean anything to me. For me, what I'm interested in is the the roles that you're working with. So is it a multidisciplinary team? You know, were there a bunch of different you know, types of people, are there engineers involved, designers, um, human factors, analysts, even like marketing people, like, you know, whoever, you know, so who was involved? What's the, the type of role? And then how did you contribute is another key piece. Cause a lot of times I see people say like, oh, this was a group project or we work together as a team. And so it's, it's awesome to know that you can work collaboratively and you can work with other people, but then also knowing which part of that you had ownership of, um, those are the, the key things that I look at. Yeah, I mean, that's super important. And I'm kind of on the fence about this one because on one hand, if you're going to sh- if you're going to say that you worked in a team and like kind of name names and provide portfolio information, I think that's good because likely that means you're probably describing exactly what your role was. And if this is the case where you're working in like a cross domain team or a multi collaborative team where you're working with like a PM, a developer, a researcher and a designer or something like that. And you're able to say, this is how I worked with, you know, Bob, the developer or Cindy, the designer. And these are my roles when we were working together. I think that's really good for your, for anything that you put out there that's your work. Um, but I, I'm kind of on the same mind as you as well. Like it, it, that doesn't matter as much. The, the most important part on any portfolio or on your resume or whatever If you're, especially if you're applying for a job, is making sure that your role is very explicit, either either being able to say that verbally or having it like labeled out in your portfolio or on your resume. Um, So I think either one really works, but the main point or the main takeaway is really make sure that you're actually indicating what your role was. Yeah, sound good. Yeah, sounds good. All right, so I think that's gonna be it for us today, guys. Let me see if I can play the outro right. All right, so that's it. That's it for today, everyone. <laughs> Let us know what you think of the stories this week. If you're a Patreon supporter, stay tuned for the after show. For the rest of you, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us on any of our social media cha- channels at H Factors Podcast. If you like to, <laughs> if you like what we, if you like what we're doing, and want to support us, you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice. For, and consider supporting us on Patreon. And of course, you can always reach out to us on their home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to sincerely thank Miss Elise Hallett for being on the show today. Elise, where can our listeners find you if they're looking to talk to you about VR and healthcare? Uh, probably LinkedIn would be the best option. Excellent. All right. So special thanks to Jeff Olson for editing our video this week and every week. We really appreciate you, man. Thank you so much. So as for me, I've been Blake Arnsdorf. Definitely not Nick Rome, and you can find me at Don't Panic UX on YouTube. Please take our survey about HFES 2018 about our bonus content. It's very important. Remember that HFES membership giveaway starts today, so look for the different description options. And thanks again for tuning into H Factors Cast. And until next time, it depends. It depends.